if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe we all watched in horror 911 the planes hit the towers and the towers came down did you ever wonder how they fell so fast well maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask don't you think it's strange there were no fighter jets did someone give the order not to intercept and if they really scrambled then why'd they fly so slow maybe there's an answer that we don't want to know and where was our president George W that fool he was visiting with children at an elementary school and when he heard the news he didn't seem concerned he just calmly read a picture book while all those people burned The Bushes and Bin Ladens Now what's that all about? While all of us were grounded They flew his family out Osama got his training From the CIA Our soldiers took Afghanistan They let him slip away A new Pearl Harbor was their big chance to launch two wars that they'd planned in advance. Now we know they lied about weapons in Iraq. Did they allow the 9 11 attack? If you get your views from television news, you'll only hear stories that corporations choose. You'll only get to see what they want you to see. You're gonna have to read and decide what you believe. Hello and welcome to another episode of Omega Presents. 9-11 was an inside job and we know for sure that it was an inside job because of the latest scientific evidence from Stephen Jones and I announced last week that we're going to have an interview coming up with Stephen Jones pretty soon and I'm still hopeful that that will happen. In the meantime I've gone to the uh, STJ 911 Truth website. That's the one that Stephen Jones uh, has been, you know, doing a really good job of maintaining. And I've 
brought uh, all kinds of his slides from his one of his presentations in, uh, just a, a small handful of them. And I figured that we'd kind of step through that. We're going to have a live call-in show today, too, as you see with the phone numbers above me. And uh, we're having a pretty good response. We, I've had over 3,000 viewers on, on uh, Google now watching this show. And I don't know if they're all cable access viewers or if they were just referred or, or what, or just one guy sitting there watching it over and over again. <laughs> but um, let's go to the first CG in that list. I, I, I don't know, I think it's down there around 13 or 14, something like that. And yeah, I got to move slide over out of the way here a little bit. But this is a really good picture of the, um, in fact, I can hit, why don't you put that right in front so you can see the whole thing. Just hit the CG button. There you go. And you, you, you see the explosions are not just in that one band of, the, of gray that you see, but down below, oh, maybe 20 stories or, or 30 stories, you see other explosions happening. And those are um, systematic all the way down as, that, as this collapses. You can see it on videos. Go ahead and bring me back. I want to and, and try camera three over here. It, this this one right here is 9/11. Let's see. Oops, wrong one. <laughs> Do the other camera. I get. I guess two. Well, it should have been three. Yeah, there. This one. 9/11 uh, mysteries. That's one of the one of the best ones to get for stop motion and the physics of the collapse, it's a real good, uh, I don't know, they just did a real good job of putting it together so that you could see the squibs, the individual squibs. Let's go ahead and go to the next CG and see what, what we got. That's a pretty dramatic picture there. But yeah, here's, now this is the tower section that was falling over. Go ahead and put that in front. Uh, the caption reads, if, it, if it's off your TV set, a precedent for top-down demolition. NIST implies that the top-down order of destruction of the Twin Towers weighs against the controlled demolition theory. Well, I mean, that's like saying every controlled demolition we've ever seen, you, you know, the, uh, the Superdome and all that, it, it starts at the bottom. But this started at the top, so it couldn't be controlled demolition. What kind of nonsense logic is NIST trying to hog off on us. If controlled demolition starts anywhere in the building, it's controlled demolition. And obviously, they started the controlled demolition up where the airplanes hit, so it was consistent with, with the cover story of the airplanes causing the collapse. So, but take a look at that. That fi fire did not cause that. Fire doesn't cause this type of a collapse. The building is already tipping over. Physics says it should have continued on its moment of rotation and continue rotating, falling down into the street. But all of a sudden, it was destroyed, just pulverized. And by the way, the official story requires a giant mass of loose weight coming down to crush the rest of the tower. But this is already blown up and tip, it's tipped over, so it's not over the tower anymore. And it's going to be pulverized into dust, so it won't have any mass, if, even if it was over the tower. But it isn't over the tower. Why does the rest of the tower collapse? It doesn't even have damage. It shouldn't even collapse. Just that top should have fallen off, and that's it, if, if you buy that. The rest of the tower was unharmed, and it had a third less mass to hold up now that the top was gone. So it was way stronger than it needed to be to stand up with the top missing, and yet it didn't. That's proof positive that this is a violation of the laws of physics. Let's try the next slide. Well, these, these right behind me, this is another example of the angle cuts. We'll bring that to the front again, too. Now, take a good look at that. During cleanup, you don't ever make angle cuts. It takes too much, well, first of all, it's expensive in terms of the cutting gas or power that you're using. But second of all, it's hotter than blue blazes to cut through that metal and to be standing there holding a torch or the cutting implement just makes it hotter and more miserable for the worker. So no worker is going to make diagonal cuts like that 
to clean up. Um, they, these are supposed to be taken before the cleanup commenced with any sort of cutting. But even if you didn't believe that, logic tells you that they would never cut diagonally because it makes their time 70% longer. <laughs> anyway, I have a sequence of them here. Just step through the next two CGs. They have the uh, more angle cuts to look at, including the one, there's a, a section that was, uh, well, that's the one we've shown you before. And you can see how hot the angle cut got, you know, even if it, uh, it, it no matter how you look at it, fire can't do that. Fire can't melt into slag, and fire won't make a perfect cut, even horizontal. We'll go, go to the next one. I think the next one's what they museumed. They, they did take about 200 pieces of metal from, yeah, see how it says save on it? Uh, too bad off the screen is, is the angle cut on the left side. I didn't get the CGs in there very good. Let's go straight to the next one. But trust me, there's an angle cut on the left. <laughs> and there's another sort of an angle cut, but it's right at one of the, you know, crucial T connections. Um, and of course, right next to it is another angle cut that in the, out in the yard, not just of preserved steel. And uh, now, keep in mind, Stephen Jones has a, uh, I think it's a 500 slide presentation and he talks about all this stuff a lot better than I do. I'm just pointing it out so that you can see what a great source of information you can get just by, you can either download uh, a video of him doing the presentation or you can download frame by frame the PDF version, you know, page by page, just what you see behind me. Go ahead and try the next CG. Let's see what it is. <coughs> oh, okay, that's more of that building going over sideways. I doubled up on that one. Let's, uh, well, we can leave it there just, for, well, that's okay. Now, look at this, pyroclastic flow. Fire doesn't do that. <laughs> and it crossed the, almost crossed all the way across the bay to New Jersey. Um, and there's nothing that you've, you've never seen a fire that could do that. Fire doesn't create that type of what they call a pyroclastic flow. Only high demolition explosives can do that, or volcanoes. Those are the only two things. I guess there's a behavior like that in an undersea collapse of, uh, you know, an, un an undersea mudslide can create stuff like that too, but nothing else in nature that the scientists can bring up. Let's try the next one. Well, there's a, a good example of squibs. You can see the the main demolition zone is already commenced up at the top and remember that's the top of the building there isn't a bunch of building falling down to force all that out the building has just barely begun to to, to fall be, when all that commotion is going on it's being blown to smithereens and you can see blowing out key supports like where the red arrow is on the left side there right in the middle of the building um, key supports that what that indicates is that that is uh, demolition of the central cores which fill up about that one-third of the of the cross-section there so there's that's see a lot of people say even if the building did pancake down the central core se uh, building section was so strong that it should have been towering in the sky no matter what happened with airplanes. Uh, the, even if everything pancaked down, the entire uh, central core of 47, I think it was 47 steel columns that get as thick as four inches on the bottom floor but taper down to one quarter inch at the top, that whole thing should have been standing because there shouldn't have been any forces to drop that part of the building. But that red arrow points to the controlled demolition actually cutting those central cores so that it could actually collapse with the rest of the building as a total collapse. Go ahead and switch to the next one. Yeah, and yeah, how do you like my DVD collection in front again? We'll, we'll do some close-ups on that. Okay, what you see behind me is unreacted thermate. This was recently discovered by Stephen Jones, and uh, this they call it partially reacted thermite found in the dust samples. Um, the, the next couple slides show the same thing from different levels of magnification. And notice the round sphere there. 
that's, that's a microsphere. And that's important because those can only be formed in temperatures that are much hotter than it takes to just melt the steel. It has to be virtually vaporized and then blasted out into free space where the surface tension of the liquefied metal can pull it into a perfect sphere and it has to be free space long enough for the heat transfer to let the steel solidify so that when the sphere hits the ground it doesn't deform. And the only thing that can do that is high explosive. You don't find that from a fire. So now we'll go to the next slide too and people say oh this is building seven Again, FEMA report says the collapse of seven had a small debris field. Um, the facade was pulled downward, suggesting an, interna an internal failure and implosion. It's off the screen a little bit, but even FEMA calls it an implosion, which is correct. That was a, a classic controlled demolition, pulling it down into its footprint, completely leaving the s surrounding buildings unharmed. Um, I want to get back to the microspheres, but I think the next slide will do it. Let's see the next one. Oh, that, that's another example of metal. Fire can't do that. Office fires can't do that to steel. <laughs> that, that's an example of steel found in the debris, again, before anybody did a cleanup, although it's conceivable that somebody could be doing cleanup with that type of a mess you know, kind of a shaky hand as they try to cut the beams apart. So a lot of people won't consider that evidence. Yeah, that could have been done any time. And that's what I was going to bring up about the microspheres, that even the government report notice, notices the presence of the microspheres. Let's try the next one. Let's go to, yeah, there. Oh, okay, this is... Um, Stephen Jones's conclusions after doing experiments with small residue samples from the scene. They, they did those three tests there, uh, which I won't bother to try to read and embarrass myself with my <laughs> science vocabulary, but it, it says uh, they identify predominantly iron with very little chromium. When there's no chromium in it, that means that it wasn't, uh, prim wasn't residue primarily of the building steel. Um, which again points to the thermite. And also that 1,3-diphenylpropane is a compound that's only observed during uh, testing for, or in the presence of, of the residue of controlled explosives. Um, anyway, the conclusion is compelling evidence that thermite, uh, I can't read it, uh, thermite something compounds were deliberately placed in both World Trade Centers 1, 2, and 7. And, you know, again, go to this STJ 9-11 Truth website dot org, I think. You, you'll find it Stephen Doan's website, uh, Scholars for Truth and Justice, Truth 9-11 Truth and Justice. And uh, you'll find this entire slideshow there. And you'll also see a video of, of Stephen Jones. Uh, let's put that, go back to CG7 and put the phone number up again. Live calling show today, 503-288-4442 or 503-288-4446. Well, I guess I'm going to give you a little, before we get back into that slideshow, I'll, I'll give you a quick little preview of, this is uh, one of Scott Ritter's books, Target Iran. He has another one, Target Iraq. Um, he's the UN weapons inspector from 1991 to 1998. And he immediately started blowing the whistle when Bush started talking about weapons of mass destruction. And he'd stand up and say, no, there weren't any. You know, he was the weapons inspector. He knows that there weren't any. And they really put a crusade against him. Um, they, in fact, something to do with trying to brand him as a child molester and all that. But the fact of the matter is now you can look back at this and you find out that every word he said has come to be true. 
So everything that they tried to do to discredit Scott Ritter was, you know, strictly political. We have a caller. Go ahead. Hi there, Bill. How are you? Oh, is this Jan? Yeah. Uh, I recognize you. <laughs> well, it's the East Coast accent comes out, you know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> um, you know, I have a question for you, and um, <clears throat> I'm interested to see. I, I think you have a guest coming on, or you're anticipating someone. But I was curious about what you're going to say about the fact that that Judith Wood is coming, um, that crazy woman that you um, exposed on your show, and she's coming with a man named Hutchinson. I can't remember his first name. And <clears throat> it's coming through the 911 Truth Movement here. Um, I got an email, and um, they're charging $10 admission, or $20, or well, 10 or 20, but I wouldn't pay two cents to see her. <laughs> well, exactly. I, I was going to say, you know, don't waste your money. You've already seen Dr. Jenkins' interview with her on my show. Right. Where Jenkins, who is a real PhD, well, maybe she's a real PhD too. It's, you can get your degree without really knowing what you're doing. And so, well, that's a fact. And, I mean, maybe she's good at what she does, but well, what she's talking about, she doesn't have a clue. Well, if you go to the website that you can click on, um, on the 911 Truth announcement that they're coming, like on the 24th, and uh -huh. um, <clears throat> you click on her website... Well, she's going to be on Alex Ansari's show, too, as an interviewee. <laughs> well, that'll be good. I'd and like to see that. I help out on that show, and I... Uh, I was thinking, you know, after all the, the things I said about her, maybe it would be better for the show if I just, you know, kind of opted out on that one. No, I think, I think, you know what, I think you were really, your intuition is right, my intuition is right, and I really have some strong concerns. I had somebody call me about, did I want to go to this event? And they named the name, and I said, that woman... I, I listen. I said this last time when I saw her. I believe that the cl the truth is getting so close, and the government will do anything that they have to to shut this up. And I believe in my heart of hearts that this woman is just out there to make us look like a bunch of conspiracy theory morons. Well, if we give it a lot of you know, credibility by, you know, presenting it as if it's an alternative viewpoint that we should really consider. You know, I already showed this is, this document here is a 32-page document that's shrunk down by the magic of my software for, that I got with my computer, but uh, the title is The Overwhelming Implausibility of Using Directed Energy Beams to Demolish the World, Tra World Trade Center Towers. And it's written by Dr. Jenkins. What do you know? and a co-author, Matt Sullivan. And this just goes through it. Oh, sorry, down boy, that. down boy. <laughs> I'm very sorry. I'm, very, I'm going to get off and take well, my answer off the line. But uh, what I want to say is to people, go there and be very skeptical if you go. And don't put me in her box because I don't ascribe to that. I think there's enough more than enough evidence to the contrary, even if we look at all the other, like, just basic evidence, not even the scientific, the squibs, the, the angle cuts, the thermite residue, all that, just the simple thing that we had the 911 commission where they refused, they, meaning Bush and Cheney, they had to, they had to um, <clears throat> be interviewed together, they couldn't be under oath. Yeah, no transcripts, no cameras. There were no transcripts, no press, no family members. Just that alone And we want, to be, we want to be there together so our story matches. Right. <laughs> and if people don't see that, I mean, that's the simple stuff. Let's not go to that they were vaping. You know, they them. impeached Nixon for not, you know, testifying in front of Congress, and they've yeah. already done that many, many, many times. Yeah, well, that's another story. Well, I recommend that you look up this uh, yes. Dr. Gregory S. Jenkins, Ph.D. Okay. Um, the overwhelming implausibility of well, using directed energy beams. Yeah, sorry, but uh, uh, basically, this thing is complete, including all of the formulas. Well, you can't really see it, but all of the formulas that he uses for all of the calculations and all of the the figures that he uses for the variables, 
and he, he demonstrates that there isn't enough power in the world to do what is, she's what the right. Judy Woods is claiming that was done. It's just too bad we have to waste our time doing that. That's and, all. Well, you know, maybe it's an alien technology, reverse engineered, you know, and maybe it's Roswell fifty one. You well, know, the, oh, I gotta say, we don't know what they're doing, so that means they could be doing it. Well, the more I look at Cheney and Chirtoff, they all look reptilian to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, everybody, we're just joking. This is, you know, don't, yeah, don't yeah. connect this with the people that, that see little green no, men no, everywhere. No. Okay, well, um, thank you so much. Sure. And you carry on. You are doing wonderful work. Bye. I'm, okay, see ya. <laughs> Call in again. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to see little green men. You know, if I do see them, I'll talk about them. You know, but until I see them, I'm or see some sort of connection, you know, just seeing a whole bunch of lights in the sky over and over again and saying we don't know what those are, therefore they're reptilian, or therefore they're from outer space, or therefore anything. The whole thing about UFOs is we don't know. That's why they call them unidentified. So anyway, but, you know, a UFO is the only explanation for energy beams to bring those buildings down. You know, some actually alien technology that uh, releases some previously unknown principle of physics. But uh, you can bet that there isn't such a thing on this planet. Um, anyway, it's, it's funny. I, I know I've got a problem coming up because I couldn't look at Judy Woods without... I mean, I, can't, I couldn't honestly talk... To, if you saw how Dr. Jenkins kept his civility in it, he gave her the utmost in honor by letting her guide the discussion and him, he tried to follow every inch and just ask a little questions about what she was saying and then she blew up and accused him of trying to misdirect the conversation and change the subject it, and all he could do is bite his tongue you know and oh I, I, I don't think I'd have that much cool. I, don't, I couldn't sit there listening to her talk about that stuff with a straight face. You know, we've got so much other stuff that we can talk about. Um, when I, you know, Professor Jones went a lot further than I ever wanted. I, I mean, than I dreamed. I, I asked him for a, a clear, good quality video of what, uh, you know, what I had shown about the, the recently discovered unreacted thermate. And uh, he started talking about giving me a live interview when I'm going to try to make that happen sometime in June. we got two shows in June. Do I still have a caller? No caller? Okay. okay. What, there is a caller? Yes. Oh, yeah. Hello. Go ahead. I'm sorry to... Well, I, I, thought, I thought you just had the answer for me with all this alien technology, but I guess uh, we're both wrong. I found the, uh, <laughs> the, the metal, the angle metal uh, cutting really interesting. And... You know, that would have really would have taken some time to accomplish all that. Um, I guess my one of my questions is, I'll make it quick, if our government was, was behind this plot, who was flying these airplanes? That's and a good question. Also, I just had a curiosity, was, was Dr. Jones, was his life ever put in any kind of uh, danger from this exposure? And then finally, what is the point of all of, all of this? What's the point of not, is it over oil? What, I mean, it's over, it's over greed or money, obviously. So, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, wow, okay. Well, you, you've m mentioned enough stuff to keep me talking for a long time. I've got another call or two, but wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to uh, try to answer some of his questions. First of all, uh, Dr. Jones got intimidated out of his position at Brigham Young University. They made him take early retirement. Uh, it started out with, you know, the government trying to bribe him. He got, I don't know if it was the government, but agents with money came to him and said, we'll fund your, your research completely beyond your wildest dreams. All you have to do is drop your present line of research, you know, and of course he wouldn't do that. And uh, it was getting too controversial, so he did lose his position at the school. But, you know, everybody in the 9-11 movement that's this famous isn't worried about losing their lives anymore because, you know, all that would do is bring attention that, hey, somebody, you know, really is afraid of something. And that would, like uh, David Gray Griffin said about the same question, uh, <laughs> 
He said that would drive all of his books to number one on the New York bestsellers list. But uh, why was it done, or what, or how long did it take? I mean, it took a long time. We don't know. It could have been months, you know, weeks, months, or even years in preparation. And we know that uh, before uh, uh, what's his name bought. Uh, now I'm forgetting his name. Uh, the the guy who leased the towers, when he uh, leased the towers, they had all the previous owners had already made a couple requests at least for controlled demolition to bring down the buildings, um, which were denied because of the asbestos. Um, and as far as the, there's one more part of that question: the, why did it get done? And everybody that participated had his own reasons, and you can see trillions of dollars being released into the military industrial complex. You know, sometimes $20,000 is enough to justify a murder. How about trillions? Um, that's just one part of it. But everybody jumped on the bandwagon making money, even the insurance companies who should have done, you know, demanded investigations for fraud, paid off without a question, and then raised their rates 20 times, 2,000%. Um, so they made all their money back right away, and they're still raking in the big dough from 9-11. That's, you know, that's more of an answer to why aren't they yelling and why are they remaining silent, but that's, that doesn't mean that the insurance companies were in on the scam, they're just in on the cleanup. Uh, if the caller's still there, go ahead, another caller. Yeah, I'm still here. Um, you kind of you, um, you answered my uh, question, but I'll ask it just to say, in so many cases that on smaller scale that there's arson or if there's any type of any type of suspicion the insurance companies are always there looking for a way that they can uh, you know not allow the claim right and i am just absolutely boggled why did lloyds of london yeah lloyds of london paid off almost seven billion with all this information that is so suspicious and all the proof that they have, why would the insurance companies just get in line to pay the claim? Well, I'll hang up and listen to your answer. And, and that's exactly right. The, the answer is that um, just what the insurance companies did, they said, oh my God, buildings can fall down with just a little bit of fire. We had no idea. That means that all these high-rise buildings in New York are death traps and insurance risks, big insurance risks. We better raise our rates to cover that new risk that we've just discovered. 20 times. Buildings that used to pay, well, I know of, this one's a building that was only raised about eight times, but it used to pay $125,000. It was a 40-story building in New York, not a very tall one, but it paid $125,000 a year for their insurance. Now they pay over a million and a quarter. That's about seven times increase. Uh, do we have another call? No? Hey, well, anyway, put up uh, one of those other CGs where we left off, if you can find it, and we'll, that'll give us some more stuff to talk about. But, yeah, I was really uh, perplexed for a long time. Why on earth did Lloyd's of London pay the $7 billion or $4 billion or whatever they were ordered to pay? Why on earth did they do that? And we do have a caller. Hello? Hello? Hello. Yeah. Uh, great show, Bill. Um, uh, in answer to uh, well, a couple of questions, I guess, uh, Silverstein was the Silverstein, uh, right. owner of the... Uh, <laughs> I was trying to remember that. ...the, the towers, and uh, an earlier caller uh, posed a question of why, what's in it for everybody involved in, in all of this, and uh, Portland Community Media has been uh, playing... Uh, a movie called The Zeitgeist. Oh, that's excellent. Excellent and movie. It will play again, if my notes are correct, it will play again Tuesday night, 10.30 p.m., Channel 23. Runs about two hours. Um, and uh, No, that's that's when the rerun of my show is. To, uh, <laughs> on 23. Oh. Oh, no, it's on 22. Yeah. Okay, so go ahead and watch Zeitgeist. <laughs> yeah, a Tuesday night, 10.30 p.m., uh, Channel 23, and it runs about two hours, and uh, it'll help explain um, the yeah. motivation uh, behind all this. And then for your, your earlier uh, opening uh, part of the program, the, uh, how, how the, uh, the, the uh, people that um, kind of uh, uh, 
try to persuade us uh, that a controlled demolition is not possible because it was from the top down and oh, all yeah. that happy crap and everything <laughs> like that. Well, that only works if they're trying to control the debris from impacting other things. And so if you really don't care what happens, you blow the darn thing to smithereens. Um, if it's a, a truly controlled demolition, such as the buildings they bring down in major cities and stuff like that, well, yeah, they, they gut the building, they take out uh, you know everything and leave just the bare skeleton and then bring it down in its footprint, just like these towers came down. Well, um, no, just like se Building 7. Exactly, and that's where I was going with this. Now, yeah. Building 7... For a controlled demolition, there's uh, you know a certain amount of preparation, and there's a few movies out there that have interviews of people uh, that actually worked in the trade towers prior uh, to the uh, the airline impact and felt explosives prior to the airplane. Well, no, the, the the people that they interviewed were explaining that there was activity going on, uh, such as oh, cabling, right. and and you know they they were speculating, I guess, that that placements. Of, of explosives were going on at that time. They kept finding dust. And, it, yeah, dust and stuff like right. that. And they'd, they'd come the, to work the next day and there would be a brand new coating of dust over everything and they'd dust it off and the next day there'd be brand new fine, fine dust like you get when you're going brrr, brrr. Exactly. <laughs> and the, the thing that raised the question in my mind was for building numbers, uh, for that kind of activity and, and everything going on, well, somebody has to actually be at the button or whatever or a computer-generated program that says, okay, start it now, start it here. Um, and my guess is that it's possible all that stuff was wired to Building 7. Somewhere inside Building 7 was all of this. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, the speculation was that it was Floor 23, which was the New York Command Center, Giuliani's Command Center, that was wired up to uh -huh. uh, run the operation. I, I don't know if we'll ever find out what you know the details like that yeah and and so you know and that's that's probably why seven had but, to come down was because you know you wonder why did giuliano giuliani never even go well, i guess they went and then were left immediately or something but they never intended to use that as a command center during this crisis they set up the first one away from there that's right because uh, seven had the hardened bunker uh, uh, set up in there um, Absolutely. It was hardened everything. Like you said, it had its own water supply, its own power supply. It was impervious to outside aggression. <laughs> uh -huh. And so anyway, uh, yeah, for, for those who uh, wonder why, um, uh, you know, what's the motivation? Um, Zeitgeist, uh, Tuesday night, 10.30 p.m., Channel 23. Um, enjoy. <laughs> right on. It's Thanks. A, right on. Thanks for calling. That, there's one more caller, too. Another caller? Hi. Yeah, I, I called in a little bit earlier. And the, uh, one of my questions was: Is you know, who was uh, responsible for actually flying these planes? You know, we heard that oh, right. some persons had, had uh, come to the United States and, and took flying classes, but only wanted to learn how to land the plane, <laughs> not how to take off. But that was kind of a, a, a question. Yeah, that's a dead giveaway that something's funny. You know, you, you don't care about landing, huh? <laughs> yeah. When the well, first of all, all the CIA dupes or patsies that were on that list that actually Mohammed Atta um, and his group of the, I look up the Venice 7, I think that is, maybe it's not 7, but Venice, there, there's a whole bunch of information about the activities of the so-called um, suicide pilots, including their, you know, the remarks of, of other pilots who <laughs> kind of assessed their abilities like the one guy that said, huh, he flew that plane in a 270 into the Pentagon? He couldn't even fly. <laughs> well, uh, it, it is funny. The lady that talk, called up earlier, Jan, uh, about three shows or four shows ago, brought up a really good point. Since 1979, when we had the Iranian hijacks of our airplanes, uh, they've you know, they got really upset about the airplanes being able to be hijacked and nothing we can do about it. So they retrofitted, the way I understand it, is all of the commercial airplanes that fly now have the ability to be ground controlled. The ground can take over all operations of the airplane regardless of what the pilot does in the cockpit. 
So if the cockpit's completely under foreign control, it can be commandeered from the ground and forced to fly, fly to a landing point and then land properly, safely. That's what the capabilities are and that's what the function was supposed to be in case those dirty Iranians ever tried to, you know, kidnap more of our people. Well, uh, Jan brought up the interesting point. Well, even if the story was even somewhere true, which, you know, you can bet that there weren't any Arabs on the planes at all. There's no, there's no video of them at the airports. There's no uh, listing of Arabs or even Arab sounding names on the manifest of any of the four planes. You know, and how do you get on a how do you get on an airplane without being on the passenger list? And then multiply that times four planes. Um, it, so what it boils down to is, um, even if there had been hijackers on the planes, why didn't the authorities take over those planes and land them and arrest them? You know, if they only had knives or sharp objects, they weren't about to be able to blow up the plane. And even if they could, they don't want it blowing up in downtown New York. They want it blowing up somewhere safe, like at a, you know, abandoned military airstrip somewhere. They could have flown the plane and landed it there with their fancy, you know, hardware. And you know, I was skeptical, does that really exist? And sure enough, you check it out on the internet, you'll find out that you can find all of the records and it's actually true. So I don't understand why, maybe, maybe it was being remote controlled. Suppose the pilots and the people on the airplanes were still on the airplanes. You know, that one of the speculation is that the planes were switched or, you know, all kinds of different ideas have popped up during the discussions of this thing. but. Let's just assume that the pilots and people were still on the planes. Now, wouldn't that be an ideal situation to take over the plane and crash it regardless of what the pilots wanted to do? So anyway, we got another caller. I think, I hope. <laughs> the caller's still there? No, no calls. Anyway, why don't you switch to the, uh, the next CG on that list if you can remember where we left off. Um, I think the most, one of the most telling things is that the trade centers have been a boondoggle, you know, for years. They, they didn't have full occupancy, and uh, there's a great CG right there. That's one of the pieces of molten metal, a 40-pound chunk that they sent to uh, Stephen Jones for analysis. He took a chip off of that and analyzed it. And uh, you see intergranular melting, which cannot occur with fire. Anyway, uh, where was I with the air? Oh, the, the towers were such boondoggles that they uh, really needed to be torn down and replaced. And two or three times they made requests for controlled demolition, just like all the other controlled demolitions you've ever seen. But the city or authorities, whoever they were, denied it each time for obvious reasons because of all the terrible health problems that people would have from the dust. Well, guess what? You know, they did it anyway. Now, did they have it already wired for controlled demolition when they made the first application years ago? You know, maybe they did. Maybe they were sure that they were going to get permission and then it didn't work out. All these things are just speculation. We know for sure that they did apply and were denied years ago. So right there, that shows you that, you know, it's been a thorn in somebody's side for years. Then along comes Silverstein and plops down billions or millions of dollars. He only put out a pocket something like 260 million or something. I don't know. But another motive for why this happened from Silverstein's point of view, just considering only building seven. We won't consider the seven billion dollar payout for, you know, the towers one and two, but just building seven. Apparently they had invested 400 million in building seven um, over some period of time. I don't know. But, or I think that was right, 400 million or right around there. And guess what? The insurance paid out 800 and something million, which means that just by having that building fall down, Silverstein got 400 million dollars richer just by having building seven fall down. Of course, we all know about the billions of dollars of payout for the uh, <laughs> uh, built towers one and two. Yeah, the truth about 9-11 and the Statue of Liberty weeping. 
That's the way we should feel. Remember the last show I kind of got in people's face telling you, you know, if you aren't standing up and talking about this, then, you know, I said, quite frankly, your morals aren't worth spit. If you aren't continually demanding to see some, you know, answers to these questions. I told one, you know, probably way back at the beginning of the series, I mentioned when I went to the bank one day, and I was sitting there getting a new checking account. <clears throat> I won't mention what bank it was. It doesn't matter. I've done this in a couple different banks, by the way. And while we're sitting there, I, I'd say, some, you know, we're about 15 feet away from the giant vault door. And I look over at that door, and I say, I say, you guys must have added an awful lot of metal to that recently. And she looks at me like, what? And I said, well, after 9-11, we know how weak steel really is. She says, you don't want somebody to come in here with a five-gallon can of aviation fuel, toss it on that door, and rob you. And she, she laughed about it. She said, that couldn't happen. And I said, you know, I think you're probably right. And I'll bet the Trade Center Towers didn't fall down because of aviation fuel either. <laughs> what do you think? And she says, well, you know, I never thought of that, but... And, and right there was a new person that I converted to, to thinking about things anyway. Well, there's the live call-in number again. And uh, see if you can pick up some more of that molten metal. I got some good photomicrographs of the intergranular uh, melting in there somewhere, too. Um, this is all courtesy of Stephen Jones' website, the stj911.org. I, I, I think I have that right. I don't know. Anyway, I've got one of the CGs I've got coming up will have his website on it. Yeah, this is showing some of the uh, photomicrographs of the molten metal. They see manganese and very little chromium. They're in the, this is the, the readout on the right that you can't read very well. It's a graph there. Let's try the next one. Those don't mean a lot to you unless you're a scientist, but um, they're in your face right there so that if you are a scientist, you can't avoid it. And we need more scientists saying, yeah, that's right. Now, here's a photo, uh, microphotograph of the uh, microspheres, some of the microspheres that Stephen Jones found. Um, there's another view of the same thing. The, he, he got a whole lab sample, a ba big baggie full of dust, and the way he picked those out to look at them is just pulling across a magnet. Those are mostly iron and uh, very low chromium. They do have sulfur and manganese, which are more trace elements that link it to thermate. Um, let's keep on trucking here and see what the next one is. Oh, yeah, this is microspheres. The signature of thermate on one side and the microsphere on the other, I believe. Yeah, known thermite on the right and the iron microspheres on the left. And you can see, you know, slightly different proportions, but the same elements. There's his conclusions again. We saw that last time. Um, the, the thing that we finally have to get down to, and like, like I said, these lab analysis, uh, that's all fine and dandy, and we trust the labs, but can we trust where they got the, uh, the samples? Well, if you decide, the an I say, yeah, we, there's a, a chain of evidence that Stephen Jones has maintained, but even if you think that you know, he's not somebody you want to trust, if you're still really, really skeptical, then I just refer you to the FEMA report, and in the back they have pictures of the uh, microspheres, and they also have their own analysis, which showed the same concentration of elements. They just never fessed up and said, when you see that concentration and that type of spread of the elements, and that, that means it was controlled demolition. That's, that's the only part that the government didn't come through on, on that part. Um, we're, we still have time for a couple calls if you have any questions or suggestions. or. Um, also, I'm calling out for anybody who'd like to come down and maybe give a presentation or talk about it on the show. Uh, no problem. If you want to give a presentation that maybe counters anything we've been talking about, that would be fine too. My point here is to, 
you know, to point out that, you know, for the most part, the official story doesn't match truth in any form. We don't necessarily have anything to fill in the gaps where the official story doesn't doesn't ring true, but um, we got a call. Go ahead, call. Call oh, her. I was calling about a fire retardant uh, that they put on steel beams. Uh huh. And uh, I've heard that the fire retardant that they used on the trade centers was inadequate due to environmental changes in the asbestos that was in the fire retardant before. And once the fire starts going and uh, fire retard the fire retardant is, is not working properly, when steel gets hot, it bends like a, a spaghetti. And with all the weight on top of it, a certain amount of heat would possibly cause all that. I mean, we... All buildings have fire retardant on the beams in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's a natural thing for those kind of buildings. Well, I understand what you're saying, and, and they were trying to come up with an explanation for how the re retardant that was there got blown off, and they likened it to shotgun shells without showing that the airplane crash was anything like a shotgun shell. But um, even if you want to think that you know, all of the retardant was blown away, the, there's still a problem. First of all, the heat wasn't anywhere near hot enough to even hurt the steel. Remember that these buildings are built out of steel like that because it's fireproof. No building has ever collapsed from heat, and there have been many examples in a lot of the stuff that I've shown where buildings have burned for hours and hours with much more intense heat and didn't collapse. Um, the idea that the retardant going away would make a difference or not was tested by NIST. They were commissioned to build, they built two stories of the building in full scale after 9-11 and then they subjected it to both heat, temperature, stresses and uh, loading. And they loaded it, first they applied the, the temperatures that they were claiming existed and they got no appreciable sag or any problem at all. And then they, uh, you know, they had the load on the, f on the floors that was supposed to be equal to the loads that were on the actual towers. And they got no appreciable deformation. So what did they do? They doubled the load as if, you know, they, they, they tested it with 200 times, 200 percent. In other words, twice the load that was on the actual towers. Still, no failure. So then they raised the temperature of the flames underneath the floors that they were using to as high as they possibly could, and still they got not enough uh, deformation to be significant. So, as uh, Kevin Ryan, that's uh, <laughs> this guy, you can't really see it, but this is uh, a new standard for deception by Kevin Ryan. He was the... Uh, uh, the whistleblower who blew the whistle on that on their sub adequate analysis, ignoring all kinds of facts about steel and temperature, and I strongly recommend you look up anything about Kevin Ryan um, on that subject. Uh, it turns out that they had to use computer models. They they couldn't make their test model fail using too much heat and too much load. They couldn't make it fail at all. So they put it in a computer model and then readjusted parameters until they got it to fail. And, uh, well, that's called starting with the conclusion and doing everything you can to get there afterwards. Wouldn't you think if that was, demolition was involved, wouldn't you think there'd be one or two people who would want to come forward and say they were involved? Well, the type of people that do that now, this is where we get to, um, I'm looking for uh, this, uh, I don't seem to have it here, but the, oh, that's right, I, I, anyway, it's the, uh, the book by Tarpley, Webster Tarpley, that's a must-read book, it's called 9-11 Synthetic, Synthetic Terror, and it describes exactly um, how 
the patsies are manipulated and how the the uh, the hierarchical um, how it actually works you, you know you say the, did the government do this well there are only a you know a few key people that actually knew what was going on and everybody else thinks they're doing drills or exercises and uh, it gets down to the oh well, I guess we lost the caller there um, and we're getting near the end of the show. I, I, I know I was kind of stumbling around, but I recommend that you look at Webster Tarpley on that question. He'll definitely answer that. And you can get Google, uh, go to Google, video.google.com and type in Webster Tarpley and take a look at any of the, any of the views that you see on Webster Tarpley. And he, do, he does a really good job of explaining that question. Hey, we got another caller just before we go off the air. Go ahead. Uh, thanks for your show. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. And all your work you're doing. Uh, the last caller there was mentioning about the uh, uh, supports on the floors. Right. But even if those f uh, fell down, uh, what about the 47 beams on the inside? Yeah, like we talked about earlier. Right. Those would have had no load on them, and they would have more reason to remain standing right. less. Right, they would have been sticking <laughs> up way up there. That's right. Uh, and uh, design so the also... Um, uh, the the guy that owned the buildings, Silverstein, uh, he had to uh, make a decision uh, because all the asbestos was coming off the beams on the inside of the building. And, yeah. and it would have cost, I think I heard it was a billion dollars. Even higher, yeah. Yeah, to, to fix that problem. And, that's, and there would be no return on that problem. As a matter of fact, those buildings would have been bankrupt a long time ago if Rockefeller hadn't moved the entire city of New York uh, government offices into one of the towers. So that's what kept it financially afloat, even though it, it wasn't a viable you know, commercial structure. People didn't like the little narrow windows, and of course the health hazards were beginning to become more and more well known. And also building seven. Yeah, now that was a classic controlled demolition by anybody's estimation. <laughs> and uh, uh, also I saw Zeitgeist. Good, good, and good movie. And that has a lot of information. If they want information, watch that, you know. That's, that's absolutely true, and we're just about out of okay, time Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. Oh, you're welcome, and be sure to watch again. And, I will. Uh, and we have two more shows in June, and then we change schedules. Uh-oh. And I'll be talking about that the next show, but we'll be the first and third Saturdays at 5 o'clock starting in uh, July. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye -bye. And here we go off the air, and thanks for watching.